This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, uh, thank you again for the introduction and also thank you for the invitation to uh, present our results here today. Um, like Gillian mentioned, um, it's close to one o'clock in the morning here, so apologies if um, I'm not mentally uh, spry tonight. Um, so like Gillian mentioned in the introduction, um, we here at the Chewy Lab are interested in um, biosynthesis of second germ metabolites of filamentous fungi. And I came here with a bit of background in or of interest in metabolic engineering. Um, and I figured I would do it on um, ribosomal peptides because uh, they are much simpler uh, in their biosynthetic logic than these mega enzymes that Gillian already mentioned. However, um, these uh, ribosomal peptides are also um, sort of the uh, unloved uh, stepchildren of the of the uh, natural product family and fungi, so they're vastly underexplored. So the engineering part was harder than I thought. Um, at the same time, I also got into this project, which is elucidation of biosynthesis of a secondary metabolite peptide, and that was really fruitful. So today I'm going to share with you these results um, of the collaboration of our lab, Gillian's lab and um, Peter Solomon's lab at ANU. Um, yeah, so um, as Gillian mentioned, it's about Victorian, um, the peptide produced by Cogliobus victori, um, a necrotrophic fungus. Um, and I'm going to go into uh, the backstory a little bit. Uh, Gillian has already uh, done a good job of introducing it. Um, so, oops, okay. Um, so in the 1940s in the United States, um, old farmers had um, a problem with another disease called crown rust of oats uh, caused by the biotrophic pathogen, uh, P. coronata. And to combat that disease, um, they, they introduced an old cultivar that was resistant to crown rust of oats from Argentina, and this cultivar is called Victoria, or was called a Victoria oat. And that worked nicely, it's resistant to crown rust, and so it was widely adapted and widely planted in the United States. However, within a couple of years, a new disease emerged that selectively, selectively infected those Victoria oats, and that disease is Victoria blight of oats caused by Cochleobus victori. And um, what's really interesting about this disease is that um, the resistance to crown rust is directly linked to the susceptibility to Victoria blight of oats. So that was in the 1940s. Um, as soon as this disease emerged and it reached epidemic proportions in the United States, um, Victoria um, cultivar of oats was quickly abandoned. So um, that was pretty much the end of the problems with this disease. So why is it still of relevance today and why has it been um, looked into for decades? It's because um, of this interesting link between susceptibility and um, resistance, um, sort of this overlap between these uh, between these two um, pathogens there. Um, and, and the key to this overlap or the key to at least the um, disease caused by Cotucus victoria is the peptide Victorin. Um, so uh, from a scientific perspective, um, there's a lot of uh, good research done over the years. There's two landmark papers I wanna point out. Um, in 1947, um, me and Murphy, when the disease first emerged, they studied it. And what they found was that when they um, cultivated Cochleobus victori um, in liquid culture and sort of filtered the, the culture um, liquid and sterilized it so that there was no uh, living fungus left in the culture filtered and then applied it to um, susceptible oats, then they observed that 
these the susceptible OG developed the same disease symptoms as if it was the, um, infected with the fungus itself. So that was the first time it was demonstrated that um, a necrotrophic or a, a fungus could secrete uh, a toxin that by itself could cause disease symptoms identical to um, infection by the same fungus. So that was in 1947. Um, another landmark paper was the 2007 paper um, from Thomas Walbert and Jennifer Loring and co-workers where they elucidated how exactly that compound Victorine achieved this toxicity. And what it comes down to basically is that Victorian um, sort of mimics a biotrophic effector and induces um, a hypersensitive response in the host plant, so induces cell death and then takes advantage of that cell death to uh, colonize the host. So how does that work in more detail? So um, that's from Thomas Walpert's work. Um, what they did was study uh, this interaction in, in Arabidopsis and at the center of this, of, of this interaction is a thyroidoxin called TRXH5. And this thyroidoxin is central to regulating plant immune responses. So that makes it a target for um, biotrophic effectors. So um, when a biotrophic effector binds and inhibits TRXH5 and downregulates plant immune responses that in the old um, six-sec model of host pathogen interaction leads to what's called effect that triggered susceptibility. And then in the evolutionary, evolutionary arms race between host and pathogen, then uh, some hosts develop resistance to that by employing um, a guard protein. And that guard protein monitors um, the TRXH5 and if it detects binding of the biotrophic effector and suppression, of the TXH5, it induces um, the hypersensitive response or the cell death, which halts an infection by a biotroph. So it's localized cell death, and then the, the infection by the biotroph um, stops at that point. However, what Victorian then does is mimic that biotrophic effector. So by um, having the same uh, inhibitory activity on TXH5 as that biotrophic effector that's been defeated by the plant already. Um, it sort of wants to be called by um, the guard protein, which is LOV1 in Arabidopsis, that then induces cell death, but because Cochleus victoriae is a necrotrophic um, fungus, it actually profits of cell death and that leads to colonization. And what's interesting is that Victorian has the same inhibitory effects on TH5, but without the guard protein, um, that inhibition of the, the plant immune response um, is still not enough for Cochleobus to actually colonize the plant. So that's why uh, it's called a whole selective toxin, as Colleen mentioned earlier. Um, it selectively only um, is successful in infecting plants that have that guard protein and that resistance to. Um, that biotroph. And that also explains how disease susceptibility um, to Cochleus victoriae and disease resistance to P. coronata are linked. So um, that's an interesting mechanism. Um, but what actually uh, is Victorian? So um, Victorian is a set of um, small uh, cyclic peptides. Um, if you look at it, so this is Victorian C that I uh, have here on the slide. Um, Victorian C is the, uh, the major constituent, um, but it's a mixture of six similar compounds that are very similar to Victorian C. And if you look at the structure, um, it's kind of difficult to figure out what it actually is. Um, it's not a true cyclic peptide. It's not cyclized head to tail. It doesn't have 
uh, only peptide bonds. It's uh, not a depth peptide. It doesn't have an ester bond. And the unusual amino acids suggest um, a non-ribosomal origin. So uh, Gilgan's lab did a lot of work on this um, previously, and they sequenced the cochlear West Victory genome uh, in 2011. And they knocked out all the NRPS gene clusters uh, in cochlear West Victory, but found that um, the mutants would still produce Victorian. So um, the big reveal here, and I guess it's not a big reveal anymore at this point because it's been published, uh, is that Victorian is what's called a RIP. So what is a RIP? Uh, stands for ribosomally synthesized and post-translationally modified peptide. And RIPs have been known in bacteria and plants for quite some time, but their discovery in uh, filamentous fungi is fairly recent, only over maybe a decade or more. And although very few of them have actually been characterized, um, a, an abundance of hypothetical uh, RIP gene clusters have been found in the genomes of filamentous fungi. And their biosynthetic logic uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's quite simple. So um, the RIP is encoded directly in the genome in uh, what's called a precursor peptide, or as it's named here, proprotein. So um, the precursor peptide conta uh, contains one, or in filamentous fungi, multiple copies of the core peptide. And the core peptide is the amino acid sequence that makes up uh, the backbone of the mature product. So uh, during RIP biosynthesis, these core peptides are cleaved out of the precursor peptide and then endowed with uh, post-translation modifications, um, not necessarily in that order. And the final product usually um, is cyclized. So in all characterized fungal RIPs, they're all cyclized, cyclized at this point. And, um, What's also important to note is that uh, usually these um, enzymes that bestow those post-translational modifications are encoded in uh, genes that are in the close vicinity of the gene of the precursor uh, peptide. And that is um, very similar to other uh, filamentous fungi uh, secondary metabolites. So here, just um, showing the structure of three um, characterized fungal ribs. And what these three have in common is that they're all cleaved by a certain peptidase called caxin uh, protease. And the hallmark of this caxin protease is the conserved cut side, which is um, two amino acids, um, either KK or KR or uh, seldomly RR. Um, and the other thing these three fungal rips um, have in common is uh, this ether bond. And, and that's extremely uncommon in, in fungal uh, natural products. But uh, if you remember from earlier, that's also what Victorian has. And that would, that's what gave us the idea that Victorian might actually be a rip. And by us, I mean uh, my supervisor, Heng. Um, from there, we did what Heng likes to call a retro biosynthetic analysis, um, which is uh, borrowed from organic chemistry. So basically, you, you look at the final product and try to figure out um, what the precursors or the, the building blocks uh, are to, to get to that final product. And in this case, we looked at the structure and deduced uh, hypothetical amino acid sequence that would be the backbone of Victorian if Victorian was a rib. And then we use that sequence, which was GL key, uh, GLK LAF to uh, query the uh, genome assembly that Gillian and her group had previously created. And what we found was a single gene on um, a short read, only about uh, 
one KB long. And at the end of that read, there is a gene that contained uh, two copies of that sequence flanked by the familiar Cax and cut side. So that was a good sign. Uh, however, this gene had no uh, stop codon and um, also only two core peptide uh, repeats, which is very little, very uncommon in fungal ribs. Like um, Eustiloxin that I showed earlier had, for example, has 16 core peptide repeats. So that gave us the idea. It's probably this gene is incomplete also because it was at the end of the read. So what we tried was um, reassemble the raw reads from that sequencing, uh, try to extend this contact, but um, didn't manage, didn't lead anywhere. So then what we decided was to resequence the genome, um, which the majority of the work was done by uh, Megan McDonald from ANU. And uh, what we decided on was to nanopore long weed sequencing. So um, as opposed to Illumina sequencing, which, which is um, what Gillian's group did previously, um, long, uh, nanopore has long reads, but lower fidelity as Illumina sequ sequencing. And so we use those long reads, um, polish them with the Illumina reads from uh, Gillian's previous uh, sequencing effort. And that led to the assembly of 22 super contacts. Um, and, and this genome assembly, then we query again with the uh, sequence of the core peptide. And what we found was actually um, not one, but three uh, copies of the precursor peptide gene, which is um, so far unprecedented in, in fungal ribs. And the other thing that was highly unusual was that um, around those three pre precursor peptide genes, there wasn't a clear gene cluster as uh, you usually have in fungal ribs or even fungal secondary metabolites, as I mentioned earlier, but only a sort of a diffuse clustering, um, big distances between genes, um, a lot of repeat regions and a lot of uh, transposons. So we did um, a little bit of a uh, analysis of the genome. Um, so what you can see here is just a heat map that maps the three prime and five prime endogenic regions um, of the entire genome. And then we mapped um, those candidate genes. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the, the genes that we potentially think might be involved in Victorian um, onto this heat map. And what you can see is that uh, the endogenic distances are sort of above average compared to the rest of the genome. Um, I actually saw that uh, Sophine Camoon gave a talk uh, here recently. He's on, on the YouTube playlist. And I think he and his, his uh, lab came up with the concept of, of the two-speed genome, where um, uh, basically says that um, filamentous plant pathogens uh, have this, sometimes have this genomic architecture where um, the effectors are in genomic regions that um, evolve at an accelerated speed compared to the rest of the genome, which uh, gives the pathogen the advantage of um, a sort of a fast evolution in, in the arms race between um, pathogen and host, but at the same time keeps like the housekeeping and the, the important um, genes shielded from that uh, fast evolution. So that was uh, one thing that we thought might be going on here, might be the reason for this um, sort of unusual architecture. Um, yeah, what I forgot to mention is that um, what uh, the hallmarks of this two-speed genome of these uh, regions of accelerated speed are um, gene sparsity and um, a lot of transposons in those regions. And that's exactly what we observed here. Um, yeah, so just for comparison, this is the uh, Eustiloxin cluster, um, which is one of the three um, ribs that I showed you earlier. Um, as you can see, a much more uh, cl a clean cluster, uh, small intergenic distances, everything is close together. So th that's just a comparison to what we found. So that made it a little more difficult because um, when we elucidate 
um, by synthesis of, of compounds uh, from the from the genome side, we usually rely on clustering, at least to help us to identify um, potential genes um, that might be involved in assembling the final product. So, say if we look at an NRPS, then um, we know where the NRPS gene is, but we also look at the surrounds and then have, have sort of the surrounding genes as candidates for also being involved in, in the biosynthesis of that non-ribosome peptide. Here, though, that was a little more difficult because the, the distances were bigger and it was not as clear cut. So one way to sort of circumvent that is to um, look for homologous clusters in other genomes and the hope that there's a better clustering there and also to compare which genes are conserved between the clusters and which ones aren't. So what we did was look for homolo homologs of um, the precursor peptide, which uh, here is shown in red. Um, and what we found was uh, two homologs in the genomes of two distantly related fungi, um, Apiospora montani and Colletotrichum erymocli. And as you can see, um, the surroundings of those two look much nicer, um, look like much more of a cluster, so that was helpful. Um, and so from that, we sort of made a list of um, candidate genes that we suspected might be involved in Victorian biosynthesis. And um, for that, we, we basically relied on three things. One, sort of the, the proximity to the precursor peptide gene, um, although that wasn't as clear cut as I mentioned. Um, then the homologous clusters, which genes are conserved um, sort of in the vicinity of the, um, the precursor peptide genes. And then thirdly also, what do you usually find in fungal rib clusters? And at this point, I should mention the, the yellow genes here um, are duf 3328 protein genes and DUF stands for domain of unknown function. Um, and these genes are still a bit of a mystery in fungal rib biosynthesis. And in two characterized fungal ribs, they've been shown to be involved in cyclization of fungal ribs. But um, there's often a whole bunch of them in fungal rib clusters, um, many more than is needed for cyclization. So it, it stands to reason that they're probably also involved in other biosynthetic functions that have not been elucidated yet. And in our case, there's quite a bunch um, in the vicinity of these of the precursor peptide gene copies. So the genes uh, that we decided on uh, for knockout was firstly, obviously, um, the precursor peptide gene for confirmation. Um, then we picked one of the DUF3328 protein genes. Um, we also knocked out the uh, DPH oxidase, although that uh, was a dud. And we also knocked out the copamine oxidase in brown here. So I'll just go through these mutants that we created uh, one by one uh, and talk you through the results. Um, oh yeah, another thing I should mention is that in the Colletotrichum cluster, uh, there's a cytochrome P450 um, pretty clearly clustered with the uh, precursor peptide. And then we found a homolog to that um, 400 KB from the precursor peptide gene. So um, we also include that in our potential a uh, list of uh, potential Victorian biosynthesis genes. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, Shang Hui from uh, Glidden's lab was um, did the heavy lifting in creating all these knockout strains. Um, so the first one that we did was um, the precursor peptide knockout uh, mutant. So that is Delta Vic A. And looking at um, the LCMS data that we received from um, that knockout strain was that we couldn't detect Victorian C anymore 
And as I said before, Victorian sea is the major considered, so that's by far the most abundant of the Victorian species. And that was somewhat surprising because for this strain, um, only one copy of the precursor peptide gene genes was missing. So we thought uh, we didn't expect to be like that Victorian biosynthesis would be fully abolished. So um, another essay we did was um, similar to what Meehan and Murphy did in uh, 47 basically is uh, take the, the culture filtrate of those mutants and just um, use susceptible old leaves and just check for disease symptoms basically wilting and, and this test is known to be uh, highly sensitive. So um, what we have is as a possible control, the wild type. So we should see wilting syndromes in, in all the biological replicates. We have a negative control. There's uh, a strain that's uh, Victorian ne negative. So those are these, shouldn't be any wilting. And then for Delta Vic A, um, what we saw was that in some replicates, we saw the wilting syndrome and in others we didn't. So we interpreted that as um, sort of the Victorian production being sort of at the detectable threshold. So it was um, reduced but not fully abolished, which uh, sort of made sense to us. Um, then the next strain um, or the next mutant strain that we looked at um, is the Delta uh, YB strain. So that is one of those DRF3328 protein genes. And again, we couldn't detect Victorian C. And in the toxicity assays, um, we uh, never observed wilting sy syndrome uh, symptoms. So um, the way we interpreted that is that probably this GF gene is also involved in sequestration of Victorian. So it creates that 12-moment uh, macro cycle. And what that cycle does is protect the compound from degradation by um, native enzymes. So without the sequestration, um, the, the product would quickly degrade with the environment, wouldn't, wouldn't accumulate. So that's why we think we didn't see any production of any Victorian species in this. So I mentioned before, um, we also knocked out this NADPH um, oxidase gene, which showed undiminished uh, Victorian production afterwards. So that's not involved in Victorian production. What's nice about it is that that gene is also not in need of the homologous clusters. So that's a little bit of a validation for our approach to look at these homologous clusters. And then lastly, the most interesting um, mutant was um, the knockout of the copper amine oxidase, um, the K. So what we saw there is that, again, um, no production of Victorian C. Uh, we didn't see any toxicity uh, signs. But um, as I mentioned before, um, Victorian is actually a mixture of uh, six very similar uh, peptides. One of them is HV toxin M. And the difference between HV toxin M and Victorian C is just um, the N terminus. So HV toxin M has um, an unmodified uh, amino group at the N terminus. So the glycine here is unmodified, whereas Victorian C has two hydroxy group at that position. So you can basically look at uh, the HV toxin M as being the precursor to a Victorian C. And what we then observed was that um, we could, uh, the, the Delta Vic K mutant could still produce HV toxin M, but none of the uh, other six or none of the other five uh, Victorian species. And all these other five Victorian species all have that double hydroxy group at the end. So then we hypothesize that probably the copper amine oxidase, the K, is responsible for um, the conversion of um, this, this amino group at the end terminus into the double hydroxy group, which um, is of significance because um, it's been shown that this, this uh, double hydroxy group is what gives Victorian um, a big boost in its to toxicity. So HV toxin M is 
uh, vastly less toxic or has less bioactivity compared to Victorian C or uh, some of the other Victorians here. Um, yeah, so uh, at the bottom here is sort of our proposed reaction done by, uh, reaction done by, uh, catalyzed by Vic K. And then we hypothesized that if knocking out Vic K uh, resulted in HV toxin M not being converted to Victorian C, then it will also result in the precursors of Victorian D, B, and E, which all have um, this double hydroxy group at the end um, not being produced and would result in the, the precursor of those accumulating in the culture filtrate of um, the Delta VK mutant. So we did tandem mass spectrometry on that and that's exactly what we found. We, we found do those uh, precursors to those um, Victorian species. Um, a quick note on um, the tandem mass spec data here, because um, it might not look that convincing uh, to some like this, this forest of fragment masses. The reason why we opt not to go for NMR was because NMR needs um, a huge amount of compound uh, in a pure form. And that was really difficult to obtain from the VK strain because it wasn't a very strong producer. However, um, it wasn't really necessary either because we didn't want to do de novo structural elucidation. Uh, all we wanted to do was compare uh, very similar compounds. So basically, um, all we needed to, to confirm here was that um, if we compare um, one of the Victorian species to its um, precursor, then we should see mass shifts only in the fragments that contain the N terminus. So that would be D and E, while the fragments that don't contain um, the N terminus should have unchanged masses. So that was the case. Um, and, and I guess that's where tandem MS really shines is just um, compare, comparing similar structures and comparing those, those fragment masses. So um, that worked nicely for us. Um, so then as a final test of um, the case activity, sort of as a um, positive confirmation, um, we did an in vitro assay of the conversion of HV toxin M to Victorian C. Um, what you can see here is basically uh, four different samples. So each, each line is a sample and then each column is um, an, an extracted iochromatogram. Um, so the left one, 798, uh, corresponds to the mass of HV toxin M, the right one, 815 to Victorian C. So the first line is just the Victorian C standard for comparison. Second line is the substrate that we use for, for the assay, uh, HV toxin M. Um, as you can see, um, the substrate has HV toxin M, doesn't have Victorian C. Uh, yeah, what I should mention is that we tried to do, um, we tried to heterose express uh, Vic K and E. coli that don't work. So we used an assay that we use in this lab sometimes is where we heterologously express the K in Aspergillus nidolans. And instead of purifying the protein, we just lyse the cells and use uh, cell-free lysate um, for our assay. So that's what we did here. Okay, so um, the third line then is um, the actual assay. So um, that's cell-free lysate from the K producing um, Aspergillus mycelium um, plus HV toxin M substrate after 14 hours. You can see that the HV toxin M has almost disappeared and Victorian C uh, has appeared in, in nice quantities. And then as a negative control, um, it's just empty vector transformed Aspergillus nidolans, um, self-free lysate plus the substrate after 14 hours. And what you can see is that no Victorian C has been produced. However, also, um, HV toxin M has almost dis uh, almost completely disappeared, which was uh, a little bit baffling in the beginning. So um, we did a follow-up test, um, basically just used the 
empty vector control self-realize it in an boiled or unboiled state and incubate it which, with either HV toxin M or Victorian C. And what we could observe was that um, over time, HV toxin M got consumed, whereas Victorian C uh, remained relatively stable. So um, I guess the disappearance of HV toxin M here then is explained by selective consumption um, of HV toxin M um, by native Aspergillus Netherlands enzymes. Yeah, so um, that was nice, nice confirmation. Um, also worth mentioning that um, copamine oxidases are not known in RIP uh, biosynthesis. So that's a novel one. And as I mentioned earlier, it's also really important for turning um, the Victorian into its most toxic form. Yeah, and uh, those are the results from the paper. Um, we continue working on the project. Um, there's still many, many um, unsolved questions. Um, for example, uh, what would be really interesting is finding out what's responsible for the chlorination, um, especially since the chlorination takes place on unactivated carbon centers. So that's a, a special kind of um, chlorination. Also interesting would be what, what enzyme does the contraction of the um, phenyl ring um, here to the, to the five member ring. So that will also be interesting. Um, we would like to know what all these DF um, genes do. Um, that would be really interesting for, for fungal rib biosynthesis in general. Also from a genomic architecture standpoint, what is the deal with um, the scattering of the Vic, Vic genes um, where they clustered originally. And also evolutionary, what, what is the origin of the Vic biosynthetic, biosynthetic genes? Um, because uh, there's no homologs in um, its close cousins in Cochleobus. Um, yeah, and that just leaves me to uh, thank a couple of people here. Obviously, um, without Gillian, all this uh, wouldn't have worked, uh, not only like in our collaboration, but also all the work she did before. Uh, as I mentioned, Shang Hui did um, a lot of uh, work in creating knockout strains and all that. Um, Megan did the heavy lifting on all the sequencing and all that from Peter Solomon's lab. Um, CMCA did um, the Orbitra data, data collection um, from our lab. That's Cam, who's also involved. That's Heng. And also Thomas Walpert uh, was really nice in providing us the Victorian C standard. Yeah, that's it. Thank you all uh, for tuning in and I'll be taking questions. Thank you, Simon. Can I be heard? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. Oh, great. That's a blessing. Yeah. Um, any questions? For Simon, I don't see any in the chat. Um, my first question was going to be, um, what, what is responsible for the chlorination step? Yeah, I mean, if, if we knew that, that would probably be another publication. Um, I mean, there's, out of the genes we have, identified as, as candidates, um, there's, there's no really obvious uh, candidate here. So maybe actually one of those DUF genes might be involved there um, because there's so many and they gotta do something, at least some of them. Um, so that would be a possibility. Um, but really there's, there's no obvious smoking gun here. It's yeah. really hard to say. Yeah. Um, I see a question in the chat from Athena. Um, missed the connection in the introduction. Why Victorin was originally thought to be an NRPS. What made people start to think about the possibility of RIP? Yeah, so... Um... NRPS 
uh, just by the unusual amino acids that are um, in the structure of Victorin. So um, in an Aramprias biosynthesis, there's a potential for uh, modification of or the incorporation of unusual amino acids. Um, so, so that's why people first jump to the conclusion that this might be non-ribosomally produced. Um, and the other question was, how do we get the idea that it might be a rib? So, um, like I said, one of um, the really rare features in, in fungal ribs is, is this uh, ether bond here. So that's really unusual in uh, fungal secondary metabolites. And I remember in, in 2017, there was a this big review on uh, fungal cyclic peptides and they classified all of the peptides by their um, chemical makeup. And then they classified basically um, cyclic peptides that had an ether bond and all of them were fungal ribs, except for Victorin, which I said was an NRPS. So that's when I started sweating a little bit. It was like, um, <laughs> this maybe gives other people the idea too, because at that point we had started our collaboration already. You yeah, started so that was, that was sweating. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I see Maria Harrison with her hand up. Yeah, um, thanks. A really interesting talk. Um, you mentioned a far away um, P450. That was, uh, it was the orange gene in a cluster somewhere and it was far away. Did that one turn out to be part of the um, production of Victorin? Um, we haven't assayed that one yet. So um, that will be really interesting to see because it's one of the um, more unusual candidates here. Um, but we, we haven't gotten around to knocking that one out yet. And I'm also trying to do, to heterologously reconstruct um, the Victorian pathway, which has turned out to be really difficult as well. But yeah, we're certainly interested in that and we're working on it. And um, it is sort of uh, conspicuous that um, it is on the same contact as um, at least part of the Victorian genes. Um, I, um, search for homologs on, uh, in the Victorian genome and in other genomes, and it's actually not, um, it's a rare find. So if it actually just by accident happened to be uh, next to the uh, er, um, college trichum cluster, as well as on the same contact as um, the Victorian genes, that would be, um, yeah, bad luck basically for us. Yeah. Um, Claire Castile has a question in the chat. Um, are any known plant rips also involved in plant defense? Oof. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on, on plant rips. Um, no, I can't answer that question. I don't know. I, yeah. I do fungal rips. Um. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's fair to say that we know very little about function of any of these RIP clusters. They're not, uh, now that we have genome sequence, we can pick, easily pick out NRPSs and polyketide synthases, et cetera. But it's very difficult unless you start with a molecule as uh, was done for Victorin to actually screen genomes for these molecules, much yeah. less test function. And as, as I understand, I think in plants also, you don't have these um, convenient gene clusters. So it's even more difficult there to do the reverse sort of search from, from the molecule uh, to yeah. the producing cluster. Yeah. Any other questions for Simon? Uh, somebody, many of us uh, are grateful for you <laughs> staying up so late. Uh, no problem. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and thanks for tuning in.
Uh, yeah. Thanks for your terrific work. All right. Get to bed. Um, yes, I will. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.